therapists. What was your biggest, I know I'm not supposed to judge you, but holy moment. Story one, I work in mental health and have worked in acute and crisis settings for the majority of my career. The most notable event I experienced was when a young person had presented with significant ongoing self-destructive ideation who was dealing with a lot of I spend a lot of time with them, mostly de-escalating and working out what the plan should be moving forward. One of their parents came in a little while later, and I had the opportunity to speak to them about where their child was and what had been going on with their consent, of course. Midway through me trying to explain some of the psychological constructs and ways the parents could help, they said to me, Is this going to take much longer? I have a show to go and watch. All I can say is, I never judge my patients. I've never watched their path or viewed the world through their eyes. But the people around them who perpetuate the suffering of the people I work with through ignorance, malice, and selfishness, I judge them. I've tried to reply to as much as I could. I've enjoyed some of what I would assume is trolling and talking about some other people's experiences, and it's given me a chance to reflect on some of my own stuff. But I must go to bed. I'd like to ask one thing of anyone who reads this. Remember that you can help even just by asking how someone is or wishing them well. People who you think may be struggling and even people who aren't. This year has been hard on us all, and I appreciate all of you who have said that those in care services have difficult jobs, but we have all struggled this year. Please be as kind as you can to each other, and I hope we can all look forward to a good December and even better new year. My use of the word judge needs some clarification. I do judge in some ways. It's hard not to with what I see, who I work with, and the situations they experience or have experienced. What I mean by not judging is that I do not allow my judgments to distort what I am seeing or how I am working, which will normally be to the benefit of the patient and those around them trying to help them achieve their goals and meet their needs. This parent, who many people have made multiple assumptions about, was not trying to redirect, deflect, or remove themselves from the situation by stating they had a show to watch, the show being something else people have assumed was a TV show. Remember, I've made the comment above in the context of a situation that lasted around five to six hours for me, but took you a few minutes to read. With everything that's going on right now, I want to make this post to let people know those working in mental health have heard a lot. We don't judge you for how or what you're feeling, and we want to work with you to help you. I simply wanted to help in some way with a comment on the internet that I wrote in one go about an experience I've had. I know that the response to this has been overwhelmingly positive, but I would also like to say I didn't mean to cause any offense or upset to anyone or claim that I am some sort of unachievable goal of non-judgment. Anyway, I'm going to try and forget about this now. Wow, some people just shouldn't have kids. 100%, not everyone is made to be a parent. Yeah, sorry therapist OP, but it is hard to say anything on the internet and not have people jump to some conclusions. But it really seems like you have the best of intentions, and I am certain the work you are doing has helped people in some major ways. Thanks for doing what you're doing. Story 2. OP, you mentioned you're getting ready to start therapy. I know we're different, but therapy was one of the best decisions I ever made for myself. It's good to have a neutral third party weigh in on what troubles you. And remember, you don't have to stay with a therapist if you don't want. Therapy, like any psychological treatment, is often more about trial and error to find what works for the individual than anything. Also, you'll get out of it what you put in, so be upfront, frank, and honest with your therapist. That will help them work with you on determining the best therapy course for you. I wish you the best of luck. I asked what she meant, and she talked about a mutual now ex-friend who was going to therapy whose therapist was more of a buddy to complain to instead of working through your problems. Turns out the friend had proudly divulged that one session. They didn't like the question the therapist asked, so instead of interacting, they spent the entire rest of the session staring out the window and full-on stonewalling the poor lady. I never knew that, and made me really what the you're wasting your money and the time of the both of you if you don't just go head first into the situation. Therapists, good therapists, love helping solve your problems and listen to you to understand why things are going wrong. I personally think it was kind of crazy for my friend's therapist to let them get away with that kind of behavior, but there was a clear pattern of weaponizing their own emotions against people who cared about them, so I wasn't surprised. If my therapist even smells I'm downplaying or telling half-truths, she stops everything she's doing to weasel it out of me, lol. 
I'll go through four or five good enough answers for why I'm feeling before I am finally say whether the real reason is not because I'm being intentionally obstinate, but I have a habit of doing it that's hard to break, or I need a moment to pause and really think on the reason. We really do play a verbal game of her trying to catch my weaselly butt in a half lie lol. That ability to push back on me until I give up the ghost is the reason my therapist has been so god successful as well as my own work put in to actively try to be as open as possible to the process. It f***ing blows. Nobody likes being upset or going to those really hard emotional places, but it has to be done. Not allowing that for yourself in the presence of a neutral third party will be a detriment to your journey. So yeah, shop for someone who challenges you just the right amount and don't be afraid. I know it's been a good session when I come out feeling like I've run a marathon and I'm mentally dog-cussing my therapist for dragging me through that, and I absolutely recommend that to everyone to experience. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to judge anyone for not opening up to a therapist, because sometimes that is one of the things you have to work on. In my mind, having a therapist is like, oh, someone I can unload literally all of my baggage onto to help me sort it out? Yes! Frankly, I'm more worried about a therapist saying, Okay, maybe tell me less? Story 3. Patient side here. I had been seeing a therapist for a few months to help with chronic depression and self-harm with some pretty intense self-termination ideation. I had tried Suprax in the past, didn't like the side effects, and put it down, but I was ready to try something new to supplement therapy. Everyone within earshot was calling Wellbutrin a miracle and lifesaver, so I figured I'd give it a shot. Since my therapist couldn't prescribe drugs, I got an appointment with a psychiatrist. My first appointment, I explained what I've got going on, what I'm doing to work on it, and what I'm looking for in seeing him. I do a pretty good job of holding myself together in public. I dress myself, I hold down jobs. At that point, I lived on my own, now living with my partner. All in all, I've got a well-polished mask. I guess it's too good because pretty early in our session, he looked at me and said, I don't think you're depressed. Bro, this is the first time we've met. I've been here for 20 minutes and you're ready to reverse my diagnosis? Cool, bro. And you know what? I 100% guarantee if you had rolled up 15 minutes late dressed in your pajamas, unshaven, and with an attitude like you're going to fall asleep any minute, then that pinhead would just say, well, no wonder you're depressed if you act like that. I never, ever wear makeup to my appointments and make sure my hair hasn't been washed for at least two days for this explicit reason. Oh, I'm sorry I figured out how to function by accident out of pure survival instinct from abject neglect as a child. Let me just go back to living off extreme amounts of caffeine so I can stay awake at work because I got no sleep last night from my night terrors and continue to ruin every single interpersonal relationship I've ever had while I fantasize about driving my car at full speed into a Jersey barrier on my commute home. Things are going great. I hate doctors that pull that Folks listening, this is your reminder that you are within your right to seek out a new therapist. Some therapists aren't the right fit, and some of them are just downright not very good at their job sometimes. It isn't always easy, but find yourself a good one. Story 4. Clinical psychologist working primarily in forensics here. This means my clients are usually involved in legal proceedings, family court, juvenile court, criminal court, etc. My job is usually to evaluate or provide treatment. I'm not there to judge, that's the judge's job, but of course I have my thoughts. I'm usually impressed by the justifications people make for behavior. The one that irks me the most is when parents manipulate their child against the other parent. I've had to do therapy for a five-year-old who said she doesn't want to see a parent because they haven't paid child support. Excuse me? What five-year-old knows, understands, or needs to be worried about child support? I got my father accusing my mother of turning me and my siblings against him. We were 14, 9, 7 years old at the time. And never acknowledged that he was the one doing all kinds of things to us. We had eight years of pure pain with social assistance. We got f***ed by familiarist CPS who only thought about the good for the family. I'm kind of sensible to this argument that has been used against me and my siblings and my mother. I experienced it the same. I still can't believe the judge involved never once asked for my opinion. Story 5. Therapist here. Honestly, I've never had a moment where I've internally criticized someone for their past. Not even the current decisions they are making. Therapy doesn't work that way, and I can't do my job properly if I'm being full of myself and intentionally project. That said, I do sometimes have reactions to people's stories, and I suppose there is an argument for that's judging. 
However, I disagree. The way OP phrased their question, I'm inclined to think they meant straight up, geez, what's wrong with you kind of judgment. But I can't ignore my reactions to people. The whole check your emotions at the door just doesn't fly in therapy. If you ever met a therapist that tells you they can be completely objective, run. That's just not how people work. For example, am I supposed to suppress my pity when a girl comes into my office and tells me she isn't sad when she tells me her mom died? What about when parents of a handicapped child are relieved when their kid dies? Am I judging them in the critical way? Hell no. Do I reactively feel pity slash sad? Well, yes. What about when I feel frustrated because a guy I work with so close to understanding that his partner's anxiety has little to do with him? Am I going to get mad at the guy? No. But part of responsible and competent therapy is that I acknowledge that part of me that instinctively reacts to others' stories. If I just push it down, it will come up in other ways, and then it could damage the work I do. As a therapist, I need to be mindful of how I'm reacting to what I'm working with. If necessary, I can consult with my colleagues in an ethical, confidential, de-identifying way, of course. Then, once I process any feelings I may have, I can go back to do what I do. I love the process of change, and being honest with myself is definitely a challenge, but I would hate to find myself critical of someone who is doing the best with what they have. Well, hey doc, you got any openings? Because you sound pretty darn smart. And honestly, I really appreciate that answer and all the nuance within it. We're learning some real stuff here today, folks. Please like and subscribe if you've made it this far. I hope you enjoy the rest of the video and have a great day. Story 6. My mom was a psychologist. She passed away and those two stories are decades old. 1. After two years of sessions, one lady still felt she wasn't able to overcome her dog's ear-failed surgery. Your dog need to have certain specific traits to be able to do dog shows. Hers had flappy ears when pointy ones were required. There was obviously an underlying personality problem, but even though the lady really wanted to pursue therapy further, she referred to work slash talk or address anything else. Two, parents of a troubled child, which turned out to be the problem themselves. Total refusal to do any kind of introspection, try to convince everybody, CPS, police, psychologist, doctor, the kid was the problem, complained the kid was a kid, a teenager at that point, by growing too fast and costing money to feed and clothe. He smashed their TV with an axe. Turns out they hadn't spoke or paid any attention to him in several years, and they spent 99% of their free time watching TV. Kid had no other behavior problems. Great in school, very calm, he just reached a point where he couldn't stand being ignored any longer, so he had what she called a fried green tomatoes moment. Parents dismissed their responsibility. Only problem they saw was the whacked TV. Kid got emancipated at 16 and moved to F out of there. She had a private practice, and the only times she expressed any judgment was when someone seeked therapy but refused to do any work or partake in the process. Paying a therapist is not paying someone to agree with you. You need to show up. You need to at least try. My dad is a psychiatrist, and the amount of parents that keep switching psychiatrists just to get one that agree with them that their child is not autistic is staggering. Story 7. Two contexts come to mind. I often work with people in abusive relationships, and it is incredibly common for people to go back to their abusive partners after leaving. Some studies show the average number of times someone goes back before leaving for good is seven times. I know why people go back, and I get that it's often a combination of manipulation, financial control, gaslighting, love, low self-esteem, fear, etc., but man, it is hard to watch and appear neutral. I can say I'm worried about their safety, but I can't yell, for f**k's sake, stop going back, what is it gonna take, like I want to. The other situation isn't really judging the person, it's more judging OCD. But OCD is weird. The infinitely weird ways it can show up are so funny and bizarre. Again, I would never judge a person for having the intrusive thoughts they have or doing the compulsions that are somehow linked in their mind to these obsessions, but I absolutely judge OCD and constantly marvel at how creative and weird the human brain can be. Dude, yes, anxiety disorders too. Sometimes my anxiety will do the and I'm like, are you serious right now? Like, really? You're actually doing this? It helps me laugh at it a bit. Literally yesterday I was eating chicken and it was like, what if it had been the brain-eating prion thing and you're gonna die? And I was like, okay, thanks, bye. I get that all the time. 
What if this totally bizarre, rare disaster that's only happened to three humans since the beginning of time happens to you? Shut the f*** up. Yeah, it sucks when your brain is convincing you of things you know, just know that you shouldn't be worried about, but that part of your brain just won't let it go. Seriously, brain, I live in Minnesota. It's winter. I'm a healthy adult. The chances of me getting bitten by and dying from a black widow bite is virtually 0%. And yet I shall make you panic about it for the next half an hour because we saw a picture of a spider. Brain, why are you British-ish? You watched too much Monty Python as a kid. It's not endearing. People find it annoying. Oh, now I'm going to be worried about that. Story 8. Not a licensed therapist, but a behavioral health technician. Basically means I got a psych degree. I was trained in behavioral intervention techniques for children and was off helping coach parents to support children with behavior disorders. I'll say this, I rarely encountered a child that had a clear mental illness in the same way as when I worked with adults with serious mental illness. In many ways, they were visibly confused or lonely. Given that most of their parents were suffering from poverty, alleviating the burdens of being poor would have likely mitigated the most severe symptoms of many of the children. Advocating for affordable childcare and livable minimum wages is mental health advocacy. I found myself judging not the children, but their parents. Some parents would drop the kids off with me and peace out with a fix my kid attitude. As a parent now, I get some of it. Exhaustion and burnout are real, but the best I could do in that situation was provide that kid with an hour-long vision of what it looks like to live in a loving, structured environment. Those kids were the ones I could tell who were much more likely to be subject to the system for the duration of their lives either cycles of institutionalization and homelessness or prison. When a concerned parent showed up and asked, how do I help my kid? I practically jumped for joy for the child because they had someone who loved them and was fighting for them. Story nine, licensed psychologist here. As many have said, judgments aren't a big part of the gig if you've had good training and spent time doing the internal work on yourself as part of the process. That being said, I don't think all therapists have done that, so don't be afraid to stop seeing one you don't think is a good fit. I often tell clients that I see my role as being a navigator while they are the captain. I know I've been hired to help plot a course from where they are to their goals. While I know a lot about the waters and landscape, psychology, human behavior, habits, etc., I count on them to be the expert on the boat and crew, themselves, their lives, important relationships. I don't expect them to take every recommendation or tool because they may know things that I don't, and I respect that. My job is just to help adjust the course as needed to avoid obstacles or deal with them when they come up. It's not my job to tell them how to live, what to do, or to judge them when they make decisions, even if those decisions are different than something we talked about. It's their boat. I almost always add, though, if I end up suggesting 20 tools slash courses and you take none, but then come in complaining about us sailing in circles, that becomes a different conversation. Still, their choice, but I'll call out concerns when I see them, which is much respect as someone does when talking to the captain. Even that conversation is without judgment, though. It's just about naming a process that you see occurring and seeking to understand what's getting in the way. Wow, honestly, just reading these threads, I really feel like I could stand to have a little more therapy in my life from some of these folks. Seriously, I know I come across as a bastion of reason and stability, but I'm sorry, what's that? I don't. You all think I really need some... Oh, well, okay then. Story 10. Once had a patient whose wife shook their baby to death. He wanted to help reconnecting with his wife. At the time, I was a young father of a newborn myself, and he triggered a lot of fear in me for my own child, a deep loathing of his spouse, and pity the how pathetic kind for the patient. I tried for three sessions, met his spouse and everything before handing the case over to my supervisor who knew about my initial reactions and tried to help me through it. Unfortunately, it ended up being more about my feelings than his, and I was new to the profession at the time. These things are expected to crop up from time to time, but I was still taken aback by my own reactions. You made the right call. Being taken aback by your own reactions, deciding to hand off the case, and then, I assume, working through your reactions and supervision or by yourself sounds like a really valuable learning and growth experience. It is standard practice. Different therapists have different schools of thought on how to deal with it, though. I'd one who insisted that not being able to put aside your personal feelings and help literally everyone was a weakness. 
Others, better ones in my opinion, believe that therapists are human too, and we have to be aware of our own experiences and feelings and give ourselves room to be human. If not, we risk unnecessary trauma and burnout, and then we help no one. Please leave your story in the comments. I would love to make a video on them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.